Oh, hello there, and welcome to Phil Talking D20. So, today's video, Archetypes. Ooh. Um, Pathfinder 2E's Advanced Player Guide has a plethora of archetypes. Um, what do archetypes do? Well, if, effectively, they're kind of the new multi-classing, uh, multi-classing 2.0. Um, and effectively, they enable you to, to kind of dabble in another class's abilities whilst retaining your core class. So, um, I mean, there's just loads. There's loads in this book. It's, it's, it's almost slightly boggling. Um, I'm going to try and pick out a few um, just so you can get a kind of a taster. Um, but effectively, all the new classes... So, which um, investigator, swashbuckler, all those ones, they've been um, also added as archetypes, so you can slap them into another book. So you can be uh, a druid investigator or a uh, wizard swashbuckler, which sounds amazing. Uh, now that I've just said that, I may have to go and make that class immediately. Um, now, there is a really broad range because... Not all these archetypes, in fact, very few of these archetypes are actual classes. Some of them are very much flavoured by what used to be called prestige classes. Back in, back in day, when I were a lad, um, in the days of 3.5 D&D, there were some brilliant um, prestige classes, and they've been um, resurrected ah, as archetypes, which I'm super excited about. Because uh, that's fab for me, because third edition was brilliant and 3.5 was really great. Loved it. Played a metric ton of it um, and then fell out of love with Pathfinder. I didn't get on with fourth edition at all. Didn't get the vibe. Uh, and that's when I started playing Pathfinder 1, where I've been extensively until Pathfinder 2. Um, so uh, ones that jump out at me. Um, that offer some really, really cool opportunities for players to do something kind of quite radical with a class. Um, because a lot of them uh, are kind of split between being combaty or socially uh, kind of focused, as well as being very much focused on um, existing classes, uh, such as the swashbuckle or the oracle that, that kind of bolts in elements of those classes. Um, one uh, that I think a lot of people are going to kind of gravitate to is quite possibly Archer. What does it do? Uh, it essentially automatically makes you proficient with all martial bow weapons. So it does exactly what it says on the tin. When you first take it, it slaps in the ability to make your class an Archer. Brilliant. So you can be a wizard archer. Happy days. Um, do you see what I'm kind of, kind of, uh, why I wanted to kind of demonstrate this one first? It's a, it's a solid and simple example of what you can do with an archetype. Um, there are ones that are more complicated than that, um, and more meaty, and almost, almost real classes in their own right that you just can keep picking from uh, because they they have more in. Some of them uh, are, are maybe only a, a, a you know a handful of feats. Um, so Archer Dedication, level two, you basically gain a load of benefits um, to use. Uh, you get essentially gain proficiency with all mar martial bows. But what's nice is when you've got um, at various different points in most classes, there'll be a point where you get a, a proficiency buff with the weapons that you're kind of, you know, you've been prof proficient with from core concept of the class. Um, it also in, it will then add this bow into that group. So if you then become, say, expert in simple weapons, you'll also become expert in bows. Um, a level four uh, archer uh, feet pick uh, is called quick shot. One action, you can draw and fire a bow, Legolas style, uh, which if you're a wizard, one action, boff, awesome. You're a bow master. Uh, and that, right, for me, is, is, is funky. You know, these, these bolt-ins. Um, another good example of that that's, uh, that's focused on shields is called Bastion. So you, uh, again, are in a situation where um, you gain the reactive shield fighter feat. Um, 
and you're immediately slapping in the ability to be capable with a shield. So uh, we're, we're going to keep using wizard because the, the concept of a, of a wizard that could do anything useful other than fire off spells and have some good knowledge checks for a lot of gamers is, is, a, is a real alien concept because it's been so ingrained in, in the, the, the stereotype of gaming for so long now uh, that I think 2E has really kind of just come and, and really kind of, well, capsized the boat. It's not even kind of rocked the boat. It's capsized it and dragged it under like a kraken. Um, so, yeah, I think that's this is another really good example of how you can suddenly build these really dynamic character classes that are more about your themed concept than being a wizard. Oh, I'm going, you're a wizard, Harry. You're a double R bastard wizard, Harry, with a shield, nuclear death shield and a super nuclear bow. You can kind of see where I'm coming from. You can do a lot with this. Um, disarming block. Uh, nimble shield hand um that is a good one actually if you're if you're playing a magic caster because it enables you to count your um shield hand as a free hand so you can have uh, like um you know like a, a weapon like your staff your staff of fireballs that you're fireballing everybody with and still have this hand kind of free with a shield to do your you know semantic components uh, to your spells Funky, very funky. Now, um, some more love for the DMs out there. Again, a sad day for player parties because the assassin has returned. Um, now, if you want to play a, a player character assassin, cool, you can. But also, as a as a games master, we can slap uh, up an assassin villain and attack a party with it. Uh, because the assassin dedication kicks in at level two, uh, expert backstabber surprise attack, angel of death, uh, which is level ten feet, um, yeah, proper cool little uh, little bolt in the assassin there. Uh, so yeah, I'm pleased with that. Uh, assassinate. Let's have a dabble in one of these terrifying feats. This is level twelve feet and is two actions of the three action uh, economy to use. Um, you have a designate. Uh, you have designated a mark using mark for assassination, which is what you get as part of the initial kind of level two dedication fee. Uh, you strike with one swift movement, uh, trying to instantly slay your mark. Uh, make a strike against your mark. If you hit, they take an extra sixty-six uh, precision damage uh, with a basic fortitude save versus your class save or spell save. Whichever is higher, mm, happy days. Um, if the mark critically fails, they die. Uh, this is an incapacitation effect. Uh, the creature becomes temporarily immune to your assassination for one day. Mm. So you fail to murder them horribly with one attack. Simply flee as your assassin and come back tomorrow and make them make another probably quite high fortitude save or be dead. Happy days. Um, so that's funky, isn't it? Who doesn't want an assassin terror uh, terrorising the party? The party don't. We've established this many times, Phil. Uh, but I don't care. I'm going to keep proffering horrible, horrible options for DMs because it's funny. Um, now, this one, I think, is going to really fire a lot of people up because, well, it's just, it's really cool. And it's called... Beast Master. And basically, it slaps in an animal companion. You're a wizard, have an animal companion. You're um, a fighter, have an animal companion. Um, but what else can you do? Oh, that's right. You can have the level four feet additional companion, which gives you another animal companion. You could literally build um, a, a Beast Master. So you could take something like Ranger or Druid and take the, the, the options to have animal companions. And then take this and slap in another one and then slap in another one and then slap in another one. Because, uh, and I quote from the additional companion, another animal joins you in your travels uh, is a young animal companion that has the minion trait. Minion. Um, see Beastmaster Animal Companion for the rules on how multiple animal companions work. Uh, special. You can select this feat more than once, uh, gaining an additional animal companion each time to a maximum of 
four total companions, uh, including the one you gained from the Beastmaster de uh, dedication and possibly one you gained from sources other than the Beastmaster. So a maximum of four, right? Okay, four animal companions, but they're all normal, aren't they? They're all these, uh, what they call young, right? Until we get to, where is it? Level four, that's right, level four, um, mature Beastmaster companion. All of your, and, and I'm quoting from the rules here, just so you can go, uh -huh. like I did when I read this rule. All of your animal companions grow up, becoming mature animal companions and gaining additional capabilities see the cool rule book page 214 for further details very useful they put that reference in there i've also given it to you because i'm also very generous uh during an encounter even if you don't use the command an animal uh action which is normally how you use and activate them your animal companion can still use one action on your turn to either stride or strike now if you've got four animal companions that are all young and you slap in that level four feet. You have four mature animal companions who, well, well that substantially improves them. So you're literally a beast master. You literally have a, a pack of bears or a pack of, you know, dire badgers of death. Um, I mean, that is solid gold, like funkery of the highest order. It, I'm, I, I love that. I think that's, that's proper funky. Um, yeah, super cool. Um, you know, if you're um, if you're ever in doubt of, and this is one of the the Beastmaster is one of these ones that's very developed. Um, so the the Beastmaster by itself covers um, two whole pages by itself. So it's almost a mini class in its own right. Not all of them are this detailed. Beastmaster is is a handful of of the total number of uh, of archetypes that's really well fleshed out um most of them are only a page and only kind of i think kind of six or seven feet five or six feet um that just kind of flavor something in a particular way um cavalier is another good example of one that's that's a that's quite a, an established kind of pathway um i loved the cavalier class from pathfinder one um so it's nice to see that really filled out as a good archetype that really kind of captured the original class in its own right. So again, I think this is a, a really good example of that. Um, again, that's a good couple of pages of 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 of, of kickassery. Um, celebrity, uh, which is very much uh, focused on, um, not exclusively, but again, if you're playing something like a bard, uh, this is going to be something that that kind of gives you um, a really kind of useful. Uh, kind of uh, additional bolt in um, uh, never tire uh, is a reaction uh, feat uh, at level four um, you have to have the celebrity dedication which is your second level feat um, you would uh, can, uh, you would gain the fatigue condition is the trigger um, you, and the requirements are you are observed by at least three other creatures that aren't foes now three other creatures that aren't foes is basically what they're saying there is a party so as a dm i would already be thinking maybe if i've only got a party of three i would just say that if you're being observed by the rest of the party that it triggers because that's the kind of point you don't want to lose face um you don't want to let the glamour slip darling um as long as you have an audience you can continue to perform indeed you must you have an obligation to your fans um so um you delay the effects of the uh, the fatigue condition for one minute or until you are no longer observed um by the required number of creatures um uh, there's a little bit more to it but that's it in a nutshell which i quite like you're so dedicated to your performance and your do you know what i mean your your image that you don't let fatigue set in until you can uh, you know until you can kind of scurry off and and hide <laughs> and and catch your breath which is, you know, nice and flavorful. That is a good example, celebrity, of one that's kind of more geared up for your social campaigns. Um, I've seen a couple of videos floating around um, YouTube where people are being a bit kind of eh about some of these uh, archetypes. Um, um, that's silly. Every 
different kind of player who plays this game and every different kind of campaign style that you can do with this kind of game and every game that you want to run at your table as a GM that's for your group's enjoyment, there's something in here for you. Um, so it's not, oh, there's too many social ones or, oh, some of them are weaker than others. Yes, yeah, some of them are weaker than others, but are going to be much stronger in a very particular set of circumstances. You know, we have to cater to everybody. It's not just for you um, or me. It's for all of us. Uh, so there's a really wonderful broad range of um, kind of flavoured combat and social uh, archetypes that enable you to do different things that are not going to suit every game. They're not going to suit every table. But there's going to be a moment or a point where a player goes, oh, I've got a perfect archetype for that, for this campaign that's going to be really beneficial for me and the party. Happy days. That's what we want. So if you see other videos flaming on some of the archetypes, perhaps ignore them and, and stay here with, with, uh, with my gaming goodness because I'm inclusive uh, and not exclusive. Although maybe I am exclusive by being inclusive. I don't know how that works. Um, so yeah, celebrity is quite a funky one. Like I said, it's going to be something you're going to be getting more out of in a social campaign or if you're being a more social build class, but you could be a celebrity fighter. Again, what I just described there is a gladiator, maybe, or someone, you know, do you know what I mean? You could still be a celebrity fighter. You're not going to quite get as much out of it, but it's still an option. You know, if you've got the imagination to make these archetypes work, then you're a good player. And if you haven't, you're not. That's a bit mean. Um, I th like I said, I think the, the initial statement of there's something in here for everybody, for all situations, is universally true. You know, you're going to be able to get a lot out of it. Now, let's have a quick gander at what I was talking about with the 3.5 goodness. Um, the old the old days when I were a lad. Um, Dragon Disciple is back. Woohoo! Um, Dragon Disciple... Um, Basically, um, it's it's kind of building out and, and empowering your draconic nature. You're really focusing on drawing out your draconic ancestry. Um, so to access it, you have to be a kobold with the dragon scaled or spell scaled heritages or uh, a barbarian with the dragon instinct uh, or a draconic bloodline sorcerer. Um, and what this is going to do is it's going to really like amp up your already existing dragoniness that's filtering in from those class concepts and just taking it up a level. Uh, so claws of the dragon, uh, draconic scent, uh, dragon arcana, and that's a couple of fourth level feats that you've got to pick from. Uh, scales of the dragon, uh, breath of the dragon, wings of the dragon, level twelve. Uh, Dragon Disciple Dedication, so you have to have had the level 2 feat before you can get this at level 12, but you could literally take the level 2 Dragon Disciple spell, uh, Dedication, level 2, continue chunking in feats from your core class until you reach level 12, and then straight away slap in Wings of the Dragon. Happy days. Uh, you can manifest uh, Draconic Wings to soar through the air at great speed. You gain the Dragon Wings Sorcerer Bloodline spell and a Focus Pool of 1. If you already have a focus pool, increase the number of focus points by one. So basically what that's saying is if you're a sorcerer and you've already got that power, you could take that and just have another point so that you can use it more. Um, so it's not as beneficial to you if that's something you've done. But if you're a barbar, I mean, you just imagine that moment where the party are kind of stood and there's like, you know, an evil villain atop a tower going, ha, 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 you cannot harm me, I'm up at the top of my tower, there's no way to reach me. And the barbarian goes, I'll sort this, lads. Suddenly sprouts draconic wings, rockets into the sky, rages, lands, power attack, dead. Yeah. Fear the barbarian, for he cometh on wings of the dragon. Um, shape of the dragon at level 14. That's a terrifying barbarian, isn't it? Turns into a dragon. And basically, that's what it does as well. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful spell that you, you get dragon form. And what's funky in Pathfinder 2 is they're like a battle form and they have, you know, silly kind of, you get bonus hit points and you get 
big dragon attacks and all that kind of good stuff, you basically become a dragon, um, a barbarian dragon. I'll let that horror sink in, um, mainly for DMs. That's the horror face of a DM. Um, which is why we needed anti-paladins. Now you can see why they put anti-paladins and assassins in. Because there's going to be barbarian dragons flying around, smashing everything. Terrifying. Anyway, Dragon Disciple. Serious kick-assery of the highest order. Um, and very cool. Um, we've got Eldritch Archer. Another old-school third edition um, kind of uh, based, um, you know, archetype. Where you're basically imbuing um, attack cantrips and spells, low-level spells that normally have a touch range uh, into arrows and shooting them at people's heads uh, from 120 feet away and also dealing that spell damage on top of the bow attack damage. Funk here. Uh, that's um, a level 6 one. You have to be level 6 to get into that. So you can, they, I suppose I would classify them much more like prestige classes because you have to be a higher level and have higher prereqs to get into them. So to be um, to get the uh, Eldritch Archer dedication, uh, you have to be level six because it's a feat six uh, level six. You also have to be an expert in at least one type of bow. Yeah. But how could we do that, Phil? Maybe if we were a sorcerer or a wizard, we could have taken the Archer dedication so that we could become proficient in bows and then grow and develop that proficiency through that one and build it into Eldritch Archer. Ah, more of the mysteries of Pathfinder do reveal themselves from the mists of time. So yeah, wonderful. Um, that has um, a good chunk of, uh, of cool, powerful abilities built in. Um, familiar Master, uh, again, uh, a bit like Beastmaster, you can kind of grow a menagerie of familiars, um, uh, which again have lots of useful new abilities in this book as well as in the core book to do cool stuff for you. Uh, Lawmaster, Linguist, Horizon Walker, another old school 3.5er, uh, thrown in the mix. Mauler, um, you specialise in weapons that require two hands. You become trained in all simple and martial melee weapons that require two hands to wield. Uh, or have the two-hand trait. So you, some of the weapons are one-handed, but you can use them two-handed. Uh, whenever you gain a class feature that grants you expert or greater proficiency in weapons, you also gain that proficiency rank in these weapons. Basically, you could be a wizard that fights with a great axe. Um, I keep going back to wizard. Uh, but it's that thing, isn't it? It's such an alien and funny kind of concept. This, you know, normally like the stereotypical kind of old man Gandalf style kind of wizard with his pipe and his, he's like, yes, my name is uh, Trumbledore the Magnificent and I'm a wizard. Yes, lovely, I've got my spell term and I've got my pipe and my staff and a bloody great big great axe. Um, fab. There you go. Trumbledore, the uh, great axe wielding, uh, throffing berserker um, wizard. Um... That's quite a filled out uh, one. So clear the way. Um, you're wielding a, um, a melee weapon in two hands. Uh, it's a two action um, um, economy cost. It's a level six feet. You put your body behind your massive weapon and swing, shoving enemies to clear a wide path. You attempt to shove up to five creatures adjacent to you, rolling a separate a five, uh, rolling a separate athletics check for each target. Uh, then stride up to half your speed. This movement doesn't trigger reactions from any of the creatures you successfully shoved. So there you go. Trumbledore, the, um, you know, bulldozer wizard. Um, very funny. Um, I think we can all agree. Now, medic, this is a cool one. Um, again, if you bolted it into... Um, a class that already has magical healing, like the cleric. This is really amping things up. But you don't need to do that. You can just get more healy goodness into another class. So you could be maybe like a, a knight hospitaller um, and be a champion with the lay on hands feature, but then really kind of dive into the medic kind of archetype and really kind of pump more healing magic into that class and be a really healy paladin. You could do that. If you want to, you don't have to. 
it's up to you. Take it or leave it. So um, one of the ones that I was amazed by in Healer, now it is a 16th level feat. So we're not in, we're, you know, we're, we're, you know, you're invested to get this far. Uh, you need to be legendary in medicine. So you need to have really focused that skill um, to get it to legendary because that's, you know, that's basically you're really kind of every time you get the opportunity, you're going, oh, I'm taking it to expert. Now I'm taking it to master. Now I'm taking it to legendary. Um, three actions. Basically, um, as long as they've not been, uh, if someone dies in the party and they're dead, dead, right, actually dead, not unconscious, they've died, right? As long as you get to them within three, yeah, within three rounds, so, um, and their body is mostly intact, you can make a DC 40 medicine check and bring them back to life. You don't need a spell. You don't need to resurrect them with a resurrection spell. If you get them within three rounds of the, uh, before, you know, three rounds, of, within three rounds of them being dead, dead, DC 40 medicine check, and you bring them back to life. Now, you're going to think, that sounds really ridiculous, DC 40, right? If You have to be 16th level to get that feat, which means your base proficiency is your level plus something or other. Um, so if you're trained, it's plus two. Um, if you're uh, an expert, it's plus four. If you're a master, it's plus six. And if you're a legendary, it's plus eight. So 16 plus eight plus something else. You're already... Do you know what I mean? You're already in the 20s. So you're kind of looking at a high roll. So you know, if we just kind of arbitrate 15 to 17 territory and you've got hero points, which give you a re-roll. So, you know, you might have two hero points. You roll a 13 and just miss it. So you chuck a hero point and you get a 17 and you nail it. You brought that to life. That, that's pretty pretty potent stuff i think you can agree so yeah don't overlook medic and don't kind of panic when you see dc 40 because high levels the dcs kind of go forward based on the fact that the the number curve is is, is greater in in 2e so yeah don't think that's impossible it's not at all um pirate pirate has a re some really cool ones in the artwork's funny as well um one of them um is amazing where is it rope runner uh you gain a climb speed on rigging and similar styles of of, of rope um whenever you succeed an athletics check to climb a rope or an acrobatics check to balance on a rope you get a critical success instead and you aren't flat-footed while climbing or balancing on a rope right if you've watched the wonderfully silly Pirates of the Caribbean uh, movies, in the later movies where they get really silly and they're like fighting in the middle of a storm, like balancing on a, a you know, a, a, you know, on a bit of the mast, or like you know, hanging from a bit of rigging, having a, a ludicrously kind of massive fight, that is that ability, uh, and that's a level four feat. So, be a pirate. When in doubt, be a pirate. If you can't be a pirate, be Batman. That's my preference in that order. Probably not in that order. Probably just be Batman. Um, but yeah, so you can see how that's cool. Very cool. Uh, especially if you're playing, uh, you know, an at sea campaign. Um, well, there's so many in here and they're all so good. Shadow Dancer. Shadow Dancer is the last one I'm going to do. Uh, although, like I said, there's a huge swathe of, of, of these. Um, Shadow Dancer, another old school 3.5er. Um, kind of prestige class again you have to be level eight to enter this one it's got higher prereqs um but you basically um again get a good chunk of stuff in here and shadow dancer is this kind of evocative kind of mysterious kind of athletic nimble dancing kind of murdery assassin kind of style build um one of the later level feats is basically the ability to teleport between shadows um which is super cool um well, let's see if I can find the exact shadow jump, um, focus level five. Um, you are in dim light or darkness, range 120 feet. Um, 
you instantly transport yourself uh, from one shadow to another, teleport yourself uh, and any items you're wearing and holding from your current space to a clear space you can see that's in dim light or darkness and within range. So boom, um, you've got this, oh, I'll, uh, I'll just whoop, teleport from this shadow to that shadow up to 120 feet and just kind of strike from the darkness. And then obviously, as you can imagine, they get sneak attack and all that kind of other good stuff. And yeah, super cool. Very, very cool class. Poisoner, I suppose I'll give that one a shout out. That's another good one. Um, again, more useful for your DM villain toolbox, perhaps than necessarily every player at every table going, hey, you know what, I've always wanted to be a poisoner. And then everyone looks at them and looks at the drink they've just made them and go, hmm, have you? Maybe I won't drink that. Um, so yeah, a huge swathe of, of, of brilliant archetypes in here. Um, super fun. And, and like I said, something to suit anybody and everybody in any kind of campaign that you can think of running, which is really important. I think that's really fab that they've got this big, broad range. And like I said, I've only touched on them. There are loads in this book. Um, I would uh, hazard a guess to say that there's probably probably more than 20. Um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot in here. And a lot of them are really well filled out and give you some super cool abilities. Hopefully the ones that I've talked about today have got you fired up, um, you know, uh, again, if you've got any kind of cool ideas for, for kind of archetypes or you, you, maybe you're kind of you, you, there's something more specific that you're kind of wondering if they've catered to it. Leave me a comment. Ask me a question. If there is one that kind of reflects what you're after, I'll let you know. Uh, if you've got any questions about them, you want a bit more detail on any of them. Again, drop me a comment. Let me know. Give me a like. Give me a, uh, a subscribe. Share with your friends because share this goodness with them. You know, we should all share the love. Uh, and I will see you on the next video. Stay safe, stay well, uh, and I will speak with you soon. Take care. Peace.